Uh, I came in Australia in 1987 uh, due to the fact that I spent a bit of time in India um, and also went on a self-exploration journey, met my wife who is here tonight, I can't see her, she's just sitting there, um, and she brought me to Australia. Uh, the first few years of my career were dedicated in tourism and then in, uh, when I was about 31 I had a bit of a middle-life crisis, I decided to move to the for-purpose sector. And as I was doing that, um, I decided to look at the field of spiritual intelligence. Uh, and not only I read a lot about the field, but I also traveled all around the world with some friends and looking at sacred sites, looking at trying to understand how ancient history and ancient societies have uh, been able to live and develop organization that seems to be more sustainable than what we've got today. Nevertheless, my work led me to Mission Australia. For 13 years, I was on the executive of Mission Australia. And when I left the organization, the, it had a turnover of 280 million in 3,000 employees. And I think we were probably one of the leading welfare organizations delivering employment and welfare services to low-income Australian families. In 2001, my wife had a very uh, deep inspiration that came from the field, as you're here tonight, I'm going to talk a lot about the field, and decided to open an integrative medical center, which purposes to help people from healing from a, a deep sort of journey or looking at their emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual being. Um, and this organization has been very close to my heart. So today I'm going to talk to you about the new science. And I will also give you some examples about how we've used this new science with invitation to help. So, quantum physics is not something really new. Uh, you know, starting in 1925. Um, and what quantum physics has demonstrated, which is what I've heard when I was doing my exploration and traveling all around South America, uh, North America, and India, which is uh, first of all, we are not just chemical human beings, but we are energetic beings. Because when you look at the subatomic level, you know, our particles are just energy vibrating at a sort of density. There's nothing actually material at that level. And there's been a, a search for the last 80 years to try to find, you know, the smallest particles that could be seen as solid, so that we can understand how the human beings or the human body function. But so far, no, no one or no scientist have been able to find something that's actually solid. What they found is atoms or neutrons or photons or quarks vibrating with the backdrop of the zero field. And you'll, you'll, hear tonight, you'll see tonight a video on what the field is so that you understand what I'm referring to. Um, so very interestingly, you know, have the most subtle part of our being, we actually energy. And we're actually rotate, vibrating with other millions of particles and exchanging electrical charges. A bit like if we were playing basketball and you know passing the ball to, to the ball to each other, and through this, you know, sending waves of energy through our body, but also through uh, the field. The second principle of quantum physics that I find quite interesting is when two particles come together, they're forever in touch with each other. They're forever influencing each other's behavior and they're forever uh, look, you know, being in communication despite distance and despite time. And there's been lots of experimentation around that. So imagine if, you know, in this room tonight, we've got about 120 people, and imagine if, if one of you would be talking or meeting tonight, where constantly, since the moment that you've been connecting with each other, would be constantly communication, understanding where each other is at, and being influenced by the behavior, and also the knowledge of what you've accumulated. So what we see in quantum physics is that the notion of physicality is actually not, is being challenged. The third principle that's probably the most challenging scientifically is what we've been able to observe is when the observer or the scientist is looking at an experimentation, he actually influences just by his observation, the output of that experimentation. So when a scientist wants to look at a particle and measure the particle and relate to the particle as a particle, then the particle will be sure as a particle. If the scientist looks at the same particle and wants to measure the energy wave created by the 
particle, then the particle was actually shift into an energy wave. So two interesting things in that is that one, the particle seems to be able to read the mind of the observer. And secondly, we can no longer really do scientific protocol which is based on control, predictability, uh, and yeah, basically control and predictability. So, you know, this new science has been challenging many, many people from the medical field, but we have now seen that uh, the numbers of sociologists, psychologists, our frontier are also looking at quantum physics as a way to understand human beings differently. Um, now, as I said to you, this is not a new science. It's been there since Einstein wrote, you know, the field is everything that it is. Um, and many other scientists have used for about 80 years experimentation in quantum physics. What's interesting is none of that science, uh, in science has actually been implemented in the business world or has been implemented in, in medical research or very little of that has been put in practice in engineering. It is coming, but it's still very slow. The new interesting uh, factor that I want to talk about is uh, the new biology, what people refer to the epigenetic field. So we spent lots of money researching the, the genes, as you know, and the Human Genome Project in 1993 uh, was, you know, the US government spent millions of dollars trying to map the entire gene uh, of the body. Um, but recently, researchers are being, are find that it's not necessarily the genes that are the whole story, but the epigenetic field, which is, means the environment. Bruce Lipton, which um, you'll hear in a minute in the video, has demonstrated that the cells has a membrane, and that membrane has what we call cell receptors, which are little antennas, and millions of them. And those cell receptors are, are able to get or to receive some signal, and then through the signal, can transfer the signal to the molecule, and then activate or not activate the genes. And the environment signals come from your mind, what you think, what you breathe, what you eat, your emotional state, the emotional environment in which you live. And so suddenly we, we're changing, we're shifting the dialogue from, you know, being, um, in a way, prisoners of our genes to, you know, the environment being responsible to activate or not activate our genes. That's quite important when you think about organization and what sort of environment are we leading our people and what sort of effort are we putting into building an environment that is conducive to our mission and to our values. Fritz Albert uh, Hopp has gone even further and he's introduced the concept of biophoton light emission. So if you can imagine that every species has slopes, very tiny particles of light that are emitting constantly. But what he's been able to demonstrate is that those by emission light are actually a signal, a code for communication. As you know, we still don't know today how all those molecules are forming when a, you know, when a fetus is in formation. We still haven't understood you know, what is the communication within the fetus that makes sure that all those molecules find their place exactly at the right spot. Well, how the spot is, is in a way challenging this equation and saying that maybe at some level inside us, we can communicate through light emission. And what seems to be interesting for me is when you look at the quantum, quantum science, you realize that there's a field of intelligence inside of us, in our cells, that we're not accessing through our conscious mind. We're not even aware of it. Now those that are probably the most aware of that are the people or the, the, the indigenous elders that I was able to uh, meet when I was traveling all around the world, whether in Easter Island or New Zealand or Australia, that, you know, understand much better than us what I call that spiritual intelligence field. So what are the implications for medicine? I've just got a short video which I want to show you. If you think you have an incurable disease, if you think it yourself, you are right. If you think your problem is curable, then you are also right. Science has recognized 
that at least one third of all healings, including drugs and surgery and other allopathic interventions, one third of all healings has nothing to do with the process, but has to do with the placebo effect. The placebo effect is really another way of talking about the body's self-healing capacity. And anything that unleashes more of that is going to be a better system. Informational medicine, medicine that takes information and changes disturbed information is going to be the future of medicine. Watch an ice skater. There are things that they can do that are not describable in terms of nerve impulses. We need a field theory to explain how the nervous system in all its complexity can coordinate everything that happens in the body. Our brains also don't work the way we were taught in school. Learning isn't here, memory isn't here, speech isn't here, this isn't there, this isn't somewhere else. These aspects are diffuse throughout our brain. And we access it from the field. Maybe 10 years I've been having these terrible headaches which are getting worse and worse and worse. I was sent for a brain scan and they diagnosed a prolactinoma. I had my routine blood test and I went to see my specialist. To my surprise, my hormone levels were completely normal. And when my doctor saw them, he just went, wow, that's incredible. He said, this can only mean one thing, your tumor has gone. One of the fundamental things that has to change in the future of medicine is this focus on the gene as being the solution to every illness. Our genes are not controlling our biology. There's something else that's needed to explain how it is that we behave, how we interact, um, how we heal. Matter is compressed energy. Information is patterns of energy. There's an information flow in our bodies. Also die eigentliche Steuerung des gesamten Organismus aller Zellen, die Koordinierung der gesamten Zellen, läuft über solche Informationsfelder ab. The heart generates by far the largest rhythmic electromagnetic signal in the body. If you look at the, this magnetic field as a carrier wave, it's being modulated with information. We think of healing as getting up out of wheelchairs, vision returning, hearing returning, cancers disappearing, all sorts of things. And these things happen. They happen. It's time for us to bring these qualities of healing into the mainstream conversation about what is necessary to create an optimal healing system. Information medicine, that's an interesting concept. We could also talk about information pollution. If our thoughts are not conducive to you know, thinking about the environment in a positive way, are we creating pollutions with our thoughts? Now, there's a very interesting uh, scientist, Rupert Sheldrake, that you've seen in the video, that came up with this concept of morphic field. And morphic fields are actually fields that are uh, in able to transmit new knowledge to species that are uh, to members of a species that are learning new knowledge. So I give you an example of how it works. Um, probably you've heard, you've heard all um, you've heard about the ten monkey syndrome, where uh, monkeys all around the world in labs uh, didn't know how to do certain activities, and then eventually one monkey in, Mos in uh, Moscow managed to get across that particular activity, and within hours. Hundreds of monkeys all around the world in all the labs were able to actually do this. So morph morphic fields are actually fields where uh, when individuals of a species are learning a new knowledge, they are actually patterning behavior. And when a new members of that species come into contact with that field, you no longer have to learn that new knowledge. It's downloading from that field. So it's an interesting concept, and you can imagine what it means in terms of our education systems and how our children are going to HSC with great difficulty, or university training, we could, we could relearn, or we could use morphic field application to actually learn things differently. So the question is, you know, there seems to be a lot of 
uh, knowledge and communications between ourselves and between the environment and ourselves and between uh, our subconscious mind and ourselves that we know we don't seem to be uh, aware of. So the question, I guess, is how do we enter the field? How do we manage to get connected with that information? Now, without surprise, you will hear that the heart is actually the most important organ of the body because it has the greatest receptor and connectivity with the field. And there's an organization that you probably all know about, so the Heart, the Heart Math Institute in the US, that have spent 15 years researching our queries, our variability, and its impact on brain activities. And they've developed you know, some application, one of them is an iPhone, where you can actually uh, wind yourself up, look at, if you're in a state of frustration or anxiety, look at how your heartbeat are being influenced by your thoughts. And if you are in a state of coherence, which means they teach you how to breathe in and out of your heart, or to do meditation, or to pray, or whatever suits you, you know how suddenly, after a period of two to three minutes, your heart variability moves into a highly coherent mode. And when you are in that state of coherence, then you start to have access to information, or you start to open part of your front lobe that um, you're not necessarily having connection with when you're in a state of frustration. And it works with um, nutrition. I remember my trying to trying to to warn myself one day on this and having a cup of coffee and I'll move from a state of parents very quickly to a state of uh, heart anxiety. Let's so. so what are the implications? You know, we're talking tonight about conscious leadership and I wanted to talk about first the new science because I think it's got some clear implication for how we're going to be leading organizations into the future. I mean, I love that quote from Tolstoy. Because if we have to shift from leading organization from the head to the heart, there's a bit of a journey. In fact, one of my uh, teacher one day said to me, you know, the longest journey is that a man can do is between the heart and the head. And so I think what we don't have in university training or what we don't have when we do an MBA is an understanding of how, you know, how do we lead people with that from the heart? And it starts with having an understanding of who you are. It's start to get to your limitation. You know, how do you able to uh, lead people without fear? How do you create an environment where fear and anxieties are not any longer there? Because as we know in biology, when a human being is instead of fear or anxiety, you release chemical into his bloodstream, and that stops the most important function of the body, which is to create cell, to grow cell cells. So in a, if in an organization you are dealing with a fear culture, or if people are living in a set of anxiety, you can forget about growing your business. Um, and you know that everybody is sort of watching you know, what's happening. Nobody wants to take risk. Everyone is in a state of you know, doing, but not really being. Uh, so I think that the first thing that um, you know, we, we've got to do if we want, if we want to lead organization differently is to learn how to move from the head to the heart. I think the other point that I want to make is every organization is an organism. So in, in our integrated medical center, we looked at all the millions of cells that are part of all the people, the doctors and the therapists that work with us. And we, we are creating an environment that where we're trying to create bonds between all the cells, because as we know in, 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 some, in quantum science, you know, the relationship between the, between the, the, the uh, things and, and the space is about creating a bond. Uh, so we have created an environment where we help people to, uh, to have a relationship with each other. We have a squat room where people can come and learn to meditate. Or we, have, we take people on a retreat once a year with a very experienced facilitators where we take them into a journey using you know, uh, creative writing, sound, music, and trying to shift from you know, doing strategic planning from the, the, the left brain into a right brain avenue. And we've been working for 10 years trying to create a team that is really work well together. And what we've seen when we've created that is there's actually uh, a deep resonance 
with a culture. Because cultures and values and missions actually feel it. And somebody was asking before, how do you recruit the right people? Well, what my experience with ITS is when you have people really leading the values and resonating with each other, then you know we create a culture where people which are not resonating with that culture won't, won't actually be have the opportunity to work there. Because they won't feel invited or they won't feel that it's a place for them. Um, or if they come and start something, they, they very quickly realize that you know, I'm not in the right environment. Uh, so I think you know, moving from uh, experiencing you know, the values and leaving them and encouraging people to be those values rather than to you know, do the right things according to those values is something quite important. And finally, I want to talk briefly about two things, you know, the power of intention, the placebo effect. Now, there's some really interesting research that has been done in America in terms of the fact that the, the mind, the brain, could not differentiate between thoughts and action. So they did a, a, an activity in the U.S. where they asked a group of people to go and practice you know, building their, their biceps in, in the gym, and they did that five times a week. And after two weeks, they have built a mass by about 30%. And then they took another group and they said, look, you're going to do it from your home in your armchair. But you're going to think that you're actually building your biceps. And do exactly the same movement that you would do if you were in the gym. Well, interestingly enough, the control group was able to build their biceps by half of the strength of those that were going to the gym. And that lasted for about two months. They, another experimentation, which is also interesting, is they took a group of uh, people suffering from osteoarthritis from the knees. And again, three control groups. Uh, two groups went through the whole osteocopy uh, lavage procedure. And one group, the surgeon just opened their knees and closed their knees and did nothing else. And when they followed up, no, nobody knew who has been going through the whole operation or who has been going through part of the operation. And you know, they followed the, that group for two years, and after two years, they asked people, you know, they looked at medically, you know, what, what, what was the outcome of the operation. The control group, which didn't actually go through the operation, but no, knew that they had gone through the operation in their mind, was actually the best result. So, what I'm saying is that is in organization, the clarity of intent is critical. You know, thinking is actually an action. So, with uh, the medical center and with my foundation, I have turned job description into a role clarity document where any member of my team has, you know, is absolutely understood clear about what they're intending to do for the period of 12 months and the performance management review is based on the intent more than the actual action. And today I was doing a review of one of my team um, and she set a target of $300,000 for a particular activity. And I said, well, that's not big enough. And she said, well, you know, I'm doing that because I believe that I prefer to, you know, overachieve. And I said, look, the problem with the way you're thinking is if you're thinking it, you're only going to achieve a certain dollar value. You will not reach beyond that. But if you use your mind and focus on something greater than that, and you're absolutely certain and you practice it in your mind that you're going to achieve more, you will achieve more. So I've seen over the last 10 years that I've been running teams that the power of intention is extremely important. And you know, we've, we've been able to increase our revenue by twofold, I believe just by being very clear on what we want to achieve as a team and individual. I think you know, organization, and I think Bart was very clear on that, you know, if we have organizations that are purposeful, if we have organizations that are doing things that the world need, they need to be sustainable, they need to be financially viable. You know? So with Invitation to Health, uh, we have struggled for the past five years, and many startups go through the same process. But now what we've seen is that we've integrated in our flexible dashboard reporting, or in our performance management, spiritual KPI as well as financial KPIs. Because if we've got you know, the boldness to say that we're going to help our patients uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, we have to integrate, you know, the spiritual into our performance management. Interestingly enough, what we've been able to notice is that when our spiritual drivers or spiritual outcomes go down, 
our financial outcomes go down as well. And when our spiritual levers go up, our, our financial revenue goes up. So there is an interdependence between finance and spirit in that, in that case. Um, and so the last, I guess my last message uh, is, now we've been talking about tonight about the state of the world and the fact that it's sometimes a very gloomy place. Uh, but I think the new science is going to bring a level of um, innovation and new hope. And I think what we've been, or I've been waiting for a long time, is a moment that we can reintegrate spirit into matter. Not having to put those two things separate. Uh, and they've been separate for 300 years for reasons that we understand. Um, but it is about time that we bring those two things together. And leading the heart with the head and not the, the other way around. But I, I definitely feel that you know, there's a lot of new technologies coming into the market. I don't know if you've heard about our feedback. Uh, but very soon we'll be able to look at the power and the influence of our thoughts and our physiology. We'll be able to look at you know, uh, things that we've created in our body that can be shifted, as you've heard in the video, by our thoughts. And we'll see as clearly as what we've seen on the, on the heart mass. Uh, um, our feedback. You know, we can see it with the heart, but we will be able to see it with our thoughts. So when we realize then that our thoughts have such a power, I think organizations are going to be gearing up to the next level of transformation. And we will find the answers to many of the problems that we're facing today. But we will have to make sure that there is connect, there is deep resonance uh, with what, I, what we call the field, because we can't manipulate the field, uh, and you can't um, you can't lead without knowing that you are what you say you are. Thank you very much.